and we're going to add a numeric subtract, subtracting the newer value from the tick count at the end of the first delay, and put this here. So if we run this again, it waits for its second, pops up, we wait a couple seconds, we click OK, and it says it took you 4,008 milliseconds to push that button. So this fundamental behavior of taking the tick count after minus the tick count before is an excellent way to measure the timing of things. But it's often really cumbersome to have to create this kind of a sequence. If this sequence structure wasn't here, right, if I remove this sequence and run it now, so we get our one second delay, we get a pop-up, notice it took us some ridiculous number to push that button. And that also came up right away, even before we pushed the button. Now naturally the reason for this is if we look at our data flow, there's nothing that forced this calculation to wait until after we pushed the button. And if you're wondering why that number was so ridiculously large, we also have this value returning before this one. Remember this returns instantly because there's no data dependency here, it will start right away. And this function waits, and waits a second. Also remember that the data type of this wire is a U32. So what we have is a negative number essentially being coerced into a U32, which gives us of course a very large number, essentially meaningless from our point of view. So what would be really nice in this case is to not have A, the incorrect behavior, and B, the necessity of creating a sequence structure. Let's jump now to a different example. We're going to browse to one using the NI example finder. And we're going to take a look at how we can use the OpenG provided timing tools to do a much easier job of calculating the timing of a certain function of our code. The function I'm looking for is in the analyzing and processing signals section, signal processing. We're going to go to the amplitude spectrum simulated VI. What this VI does is basically simulate an amplitude spectrum analyzer. If we were to run it, we see we get the ability to specify information about the signal generator, whether it's a sine wave, which gives us just a single peak, or if it were a triangle, or a square wave, we see that we get multiple peaks on the harmonics. The actual behavior of this isn't so important, but let's say we want to determine how long it actually takes us to do the FFT analysis behind the scenes. So let's kill the VI, take a look at the block diagram. See, it's very simple. There's a VI which generates our signal, and there's a VI which performs the FFT. So what we want to do is measure how long it took the FFT function to execute. One way to do this, as we saw previously, was to create a sequence structure around the function, adding a frame before getting the millisecond count, and then adding a frame after getting the millisecond count and subtracting it. In order to do that, we're going to have to move a lot of stuff around. We're going to make our block diagram a heck of a lot larger. Let's open our OpenG subpalette, pin it down, then access the time tools. If we activate our context help, we see that we have three functions here, the tick count in millisecond, which has the exact same behavior as the standard tick count, except notice that it has an error in and an error out. Same is basically true for the wait millisecond and the wait until next millisecond multiple. They have the same fundamental input and output, except they also have an error in and an error out. We also have an additional Boolean input called wait on error that allows us to specify whether or not the wait functionality actually executes if the error in indicates that there has been an error. Let's put down the tick count function. This is the one we want to perform our timing. Recall that what we want to do here is to measure the time it took for the FFT to take place. So what we need is a tick count before and a tick count after. We can take advantage of data flow and the presence of these error lines to very simply put down a tick counter here, make a control copy of it, just move these wires a little bit, and put in a tick count afterwards. And we'll just reconnect the output errors as they were. So notice here we do not need a sequence structure because we have data flow determining the order of things simply by the presence of the error chain. If we were now to place down a numeric subtract, subtract, remember, the newest from the previous. If we were to create an indicator for this, change its label FFT time, 
Now when we run this code, we can observe the time. We see that we have a measurement of the time it takes for the FFT to take place. And if we play with these parameters a little bit, maybe multiplying the sample rate and the number of points by 10, we can get a measurable time delay, maybe by 100, get even more delay. We can observe the behavior that things change depending on the inputs that we've selected. So what we've done here, without having to perform major surgery on a block diagram, we've added the ability to put in the timing of things. So in summary, we've talked about timing. We've talked about the importance of specifying timing in a very careful way, the fundamental difference between the wait and the wait until next millisecond multiple functions. We also talked about the benefits of the OpenG timing functions, the fact that they allow you to use the error chain to much more simply specify the order of things and thus determine the timing. We also talked about some of the more advanced functionality added into the OpenG wait and wait until next millisecond multiple that allow you to not wait on the instance of an upstream error. Thank you very much for watching this blog entry. As always, I invite you to post any comments below and you can always contact us if you have any other questions or would like any more information, thank you for visiting. Bye for now.